I wasn't sure what to do, to be honest, until this morning. So all I've called it is reflections on course. So it's just like random thoughts that have come into my mind. Uh, I haven't read the textbook is, is a problem. I was, Kenneth asked me to look at the unit that deals with fiscal policy. So, and, and my background, I used to work, I worked in National Treasury for quite a few years doing fiscal policy. And uh, I'm now transitioning into teaching. So I'm not really a teacher either. Uh, and certainly not an undergraduate teacher. So those are my, my um, weaknesses in this part. So this is just what I thought, uh, reading the chapter and listening to us today. Um, so I'm going to look, first I have a thing of what does a great economist look like, because I was provoked by uh, what Wendy and Sam presented. Then I think it's important that we're in a very, one, one thing we have in South Africa is a data-rich environment. And I want to demonstrate that and make a proposal about how we can maybe link that to our work in developing core. Then I have something that's just saying, when you look at the macroeconomics of OECD countries, there are things that jump out at you that you would think uh, they're not talking about the same place where we're operating. Uh, and, and again, it's a, it's a reflection on just the one chapter on fiscal policy. So what is confusing about OECD macroeconomics in the South African context? And lastly, just some ideas for maybe case studies. I think maybe they're too topical, but also some conceptual developments. So first of all, uh, I'm going to continue the religious theme uh, started by Mzwanele. I've managed to put uh, St. Paul and, and Cheikh Vara and Fidel on one slide. Uh, apart from having beards, they have nothing in common except that I've put them on a slide. And why? Because I have two anecdotes about uh, learning economics. Um, the first is uh, St. Paul, which is that when I first learned economics, uh, and I didn't learn undergraduate, I studied with a postgraduate diploma, um, and I was studying with somebody, and, and I, what struck me about it was not that it was dealing with a value system, it, it, not that it was dealing with a value system or a economy that was different from the one I understood in the world. But just it was just so abstract that it didn't touch anything real that I could understand. And I complained about this bitterly, and somebody else who I was studying with, who was much uh, older than me, said, just relax. When you study theology, the first thing you need to understand is learn the Bible. Once you have learned the Bible, then you can ask whether God exists. But if you want to ask whether God exists before you've learned the Bible, you're going to end up getting confused. Now, I think this is exactly how uh, economics is approached, that you must just learn all this stuff. Don't worry, when you get to a certain level, maybe if you do a PhD, you will then be able to ask the critical questions about it. Um, and I think what Kaur is trying to do is say, no, let's ask whether God exists right from the beginning, because that's why you have come to learn theology. So the second anecdote, and I, I don't know if this is true or false, it's just uh, something that is out there, that when, after the Cuban Revolution, uh, there was a meeting and Fidel said, who's an economist in the room? And Che raised his hand. And Fidel said, okay, you're going to be the governor of the central bank. And then Che became the governor of the central bank. And then uh, afterwards, Fidel went to him and said, I didn't know that uh, you're, a, you're an economist. And he said, no, I misheard you. I thought you said, who's a communist? <laughs> so here, Fidel, a few months later, is going and ask him whether... Um, his monetary policy is optimized in terms of a Taylor rule. And uh, Che is thinking about it. He's not sure what's the answer. But the reason I'm, I'm conveying this anecdote is that we must remember that we are not teaching people who have come in it, into economics in order to become Nobel Prize winners in economics. We are teaching people or, or let me put it another way. There are many people who do economics, who need economics, who face economic policy issues in their lives, who are not economists. I'm sure if you did a poll of most of the students who, who register to do economics in the first year, many of them will say, I want to do economics because I want to be a business person, because I want to understand business. 
Uh, others want to go into politics. That's why they're doing economics. So we should not ever forget that e economics is not only for economists. Um, then, what does a great economist look like? My objection to uh, what CORE presents as what a great economist looks like is, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of white male dimension to it, that's a problem for sure, but there's something that all of these people who are economists in South Africa, who are practicing economists in South Africa, have in common, which is very important. And that is that none of them work in a university. All of them are working either in the private sector or the public sector or somewhere making economic policy decisions uh, that impact on other people's lives. But they're people who have studied and are practicing e economics. And I think, uh, again, we shouldn't think that people are studying economics in order to... that The role model of a great economist doesn't need to be somebody who's done a PhD economist and is now full full-time working in a university. There are many other people out there um, who come from an economics background that do all kinds of interesting things. So, extracts from a data-rich environment, uh, South Africa, and these are just things that I thought, these are just graphs that I thought, I, I don't know, that I would, if I was starting with economic undergraduates, macroeconomics in particular, and fiscal policy, I would start with this. This one is showing, the dark line is, actual GDP growth in South Africa from 2009 until 2019 or 2017, let's say, with the forecast. And the dotted parts are the national treasury forecasts of economic growth over that period. And uh, this, is, this is also sometimes called a hockey stick, by the way. Uh, this, so you can see that actual GDP, and this is after the global crisis, right? So after the global crisis, GDP bounced back, and then we assumed that this was a cyclical departure from the norm. And we will be going back to 4% growth, which is where we were before the crisis. And we continued to, the, to assume this in every budget since then, for a period of five or six years. And now this is not a commentary on the National Treasury in South Africa. I could have done the same with IMF forecasts of global growth. Now the reason that there's two important points that come out of this. Firstly, economists don't know what the future holds and, and need to have a bit of humility about what their job is. But secondly, there's an important point about, we discussed yesterday what is an economic model and what is economic modeling for. But there's an important point about what is macroeconomic modeling for. And certainly it's not for predicting the future, because that is clearly, it's not good at that. But it is for having a debate amongst uh, educated people uh, about what is the consistent framework within which we understand how the economy develops? Um, so I thought that's important for a number of reasons, some of which I'll come back to. Secondly, I'm glad Gilad is here because me and him had a debate uh, in the pages of some online publication about whether the budget represented austerity. And here I'm saying, is this what austerity looks like? And all it is, is national government non-interest expenditure as a share of GDP since 1997 and revenue, tax revenue. And of course the difference between these two lines is what is called the primary balance. And in the textbook you have a, a reference, I didn't check the game, but there's like an online game where you use the primary balance, predictions of the primary balance to predict the debt uh, service costs. Of course, if this is your prediction for growth, sorry, to, to predict the debt to GDP ratio. So if this is your prediction for growth, then already your denominator in that ratio is, is likely to be far off. But here, after the transition to democracy, we had something very strange that economic theory wouldn't pr uh, predict because uh, in the book somewhere there's a median voter model. And there's a whole lot of theory, Meltzer, Richards models about how 
if the, what's the difference between the medium voter's income and the, and the mean income? In other words, what's the inequality in society? And if you have a highly unequal society and the median voter determines policy, you will expect a much more, a much bigger state. But what happened in South Africa is we extended the franchise and then immediately we had a fall in expenditure as a share of GDP. Why? Was it about the cycle? Uh, was it an austerity policy? I'm sure some would agree it was. But then from the period of 2000 up until 2009, we had a massive uh, expansion in expenditure from below 20% of GDP to around 26, 27% of GDP. Um, and then expenditure stabilizing. And after the crisis when tax collapsed, we have then, the tax burden has been increasing and increasing to close the, the, the primary deficit. Now, I don't want to go into all of the debates about it, but I'm just saying this, to me, is the type of thing that can explain and be a basis for discussion of fiscal policy. So, lastly on this section is just that we have a data-rich environment. This is the National Treasury website where you can download a whole lot of time series data in Excel format on budget, various budget information. This is something called Vuleka Mali, which is an a, a initiative between National Treasury and civil society to make budget data available in a more accessible form. And this is the Reserve Bank's uh, online download facility, where the entire national accounts are available. Now, that's an excellent facility. But the problem with it is, is that it's, it's, you kind of need insider knowledge. Like, I can tell you right now that if you want GDP, it's KBP 6006. That's the code, right? So we know as economists, but it, it's a bit confusing, right? Um, so what I wanted to suggest, that we have all this data and there's other sources. There's data first in Cape Town and all kinds of things. Could we take, because there's this Fred thing in, in court, could we take... Um, a limited amount of time series from the National Accounts Data Series, Y, C, G, I, whatever, maybe 50 variables, and design a, an internet platform that sits on top of the uh, Saab data set where you can then manipulate and download uh, that kind of uh, data that is aimed at undergraduate economic students. And um, as I say here, surely the Saab could fund this. And I actually um, hoodwinked or, 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 or grabbed a hold of the, the head of uh, research at Saab last night and, and proposed this to him. So it's something that I think could also give this group uh, some practical program of, of actually setting up a, a useful interface for undergraduates in understanding the data. Okay, so the next thing is, is things that I think, and I'm going to rush through this because otherwise it's going to take too long, but things that I think are important for us to understand. And, and the first is extreme inequality in a South African context is foundational. It's not something that comes after you've studied the economics. So if you read the text, and I'll just use one example. In the text, it says when it's explaining household wealth, it says, imagine a, a, a house with a mortgage, a household with a mortgage, and this is the homeowner's equity and the, the house price falls and all of this kind of stuff. Now, well, let me come back to this. This just shows it's concentration shares. So the gray bars is market income. So the top 10, and Piketty likes dividing the population into these sections. So the top 10% of the population or households, top 10% of households, earn, what, 70%, 65% of market income. The middle 40 is uh, about 30% of market income, and the, and the bottom 50% earn almost nothing in market income. So whenever we're talking about homeowners' equity, and most of our students probably come from this, um, this uh, part of the economy, but we're not in a world where most people know somebody who has a mortgage. That is not the reality that we're dealing with. So, so that's the one thing. The second is that, so, so there's a whole, whereas in Europe or America, there is inequality, 
but mortgages are widely distributed. The, the, the extremity is not as large as it is here, and it makes a fundamental difference to how we approach uh, what we do, because it, it colors the backgrounds of the students, and we can easily make assumptions about what people understand about the economy that doesn't take this into account. It also means that there must be some element of dualism in our understanding, that we're not dealing with, in a, in, there's a sense in which we're not dealing with one integrated economy, we're dealing with very different worlds in one country. I don't wanna, maybe I'll just skip over this, but there's, there's other just small things like, the text talks about unemployment benefit automatically responding in a, in a recession to uh, the rise in unemployment. In uh, South Africa, and in fact in all developing countries, there's no automaticity on the expenditure side of the budget. Automaticity or automatic adjustment to the business cycle is all on the revenue side, which means it has a, 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 an implication for, the, for inequality. Because as the recession hits, the rich, the taxpayers, essentially get uh, the benefit of that automatic stabilization. But there's no automatic adjustment that, that benefits the recipients of, of state expenditure. Um, and there's a sense in which the whole of macroeconomics or macroeconomic stabilization policy is actually about this. Because if you ask in the South African context, you can think of it like this, who is C? You, you've got this variable C, right? But this kind of will describe that distribution of C. So like, C is about this, it's about the top 50% of the economy, but really it's about the top 10%. That's the, the inflationary employment trade-off that you're managing, it's all up there. Secondly, I mean, and this is not a criticism of core. It's just, I'm trying to, it's, it's like you see these things and you see why people get confused. So this is from the textbook. And it's showing the labor market is great. Bring together the labor market and aggregate demand management with fiscal policy. So that's the simple Keynesian model. That's the, the core model of the labor market. You can see you've got unemployment here. And you can use aggregate demand through the multiplier to shift the, the kind of unemployment level when there's a recession between uh, 9.5 million, I suppose, people and 10 million people. The problem in South Africa is that we are dealing with this that our labor supply is here. And we're now having a discussion about fluctuations around here. And naturally, people draw the conclusion that the best tool to address this problem is some combination of fiscal and monetary policy. And we can have all kinds of debates about fiscal and monetary policy, and they're important debates, and they shouldn't be suppressed. But this fundamental reality that, the, you know, what I'm saying is macroeconomics is about fluctuations, right? <laughs> Wendy doesn't agree with me. But, okay, that's, that's my point, is that <laughs> what people are interested in is, is structural mass unemployment. So, lastly, the business cycle. And, it, and again, all of these things are about fluctuation. This is what we're taught about the business cycle, right? This is, or this is what most economic students come out with understanding the business cycle. The reality is this in South Africa over the last 20 years, that you had a fluctu fluctuation around some potential output growth, and then since 2010 you had a completely different trajectory of growth. What are the tools that you use to address one or the other? How do you distinguish between a fundamental shift in the growth path and a cyclical shift. And that's a lot of what the debate is, is in South Africa today. Over a longer period of time, that's the log of US GDP per capita with just a straight trend line through it. And of course, in America, there's a massive debate about does what happened since 2008 represent a new trajectory or is it a cyclical departure that can be corrected by fiscal and monetary intervention? Massive important debate, but if I take exactly the same uh, logic and apply it to South Africa, that's GDP per capita, log of GDP per capita in South Africa. So it, it's like, okay, maybe the, let me go to the quote, which is from 
paper by Pritchett in 2000, that almost nothing that is true of USA GDP per capita or that of any other country in the OECD is true of the growth experience of developing countries. A single time trend doesn't adequately characterize the evolution of GDP per capita in most developing countries. So there's a theory in international macroeconomics about that they say the cycle is the trend, that we have permanent shocks. And all I'm saying is that the book, both I think the, the preceding chapter and the fiscal policy chapter are all about the business cycle, which is important. But again, it's these structural shifts that we need to get a handle of in our macroeconomics, which is maybe more about other stuff. So the case studies I thought we might think about, and I don't know whether this is uh, too topical or some of them might be. But firstly, there's a paper by Banerjee and others from, from 2008 or thereabouts, um, The Perfect Storm of Mass Unemployment. So how did South Africa go from a full employment situation, which we had under apartheid in the 70s, to mass unemployment? And they ascribe it to, so it happened during the 80s, so you had the collapse of the mining sector. So looking at the mining sector in the South African economy over the long term, what happened to mining employment, which peaks in, 2000, in 1987 and then collapses dramatically. So you had a massive surge of low-skilled uh, unemployment. Then you had a massive increase in labor force participation rates associated with the transition to democracy. Thirdly, you had globalization unleashed in the economy in a very rapid way, mainly through trade liberalization. So the combination of those things led to this new equilibrium of mass unemployment. Did policy help or hinder is a problem. Secondly, e-tolls, um, you know, links to a whole kind of bunch of issues about congestion, the use of user charges versus uh, tax finance, public expenditure, tax incidents, you know, are, are e-tolls more progressive than tax funded roads? Um, higher education, uh, and I was partly provoked last night when uh, Samuel Ball said something that I, I thought he should say here today because uh, it, will, it will rile you that uh, elite families, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but often we spend too much on higher education and not enough on basic education because elite families don't want to pay for their children's education, right? Uh, that's what he said. Um, so I'm saying, is higher education a public good? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a debate and there are different... Uh, what are the economics and the morals of free universities? Basic education versus higher education spending. Uh, and then lastly, black economic empowerment as an attempt at reforming capital ownership in South Africa. Issues of class and race have a very long pedigree in South African political economy that we need to draw on and, and bring back. Um, and then the, the, the idea of redistribution of income versus redistribution of wealth. We do quite a lot of redistribution of income in South Africa, but the redistribution of wealth remains stubborn. Finally, some conceptual issues that I feel are, we need to think about. The first, Mzwanele alluded to as well, and that is dualism. So the one entry into dualism is the Lewis model. And the Lewis model is important, but if you, had, if you had been studying economics 30 or 40 years ago in South Africa, you would have, your textbook would have been written by somebody called Hobart Houghton, who used the Lewis model to explain the existence of Bantustans in South Africa. So the Bantustans were the, were the unproductive economy and then the white economy was the productive economy and the marginal product of labor was higher in the one than the other. So you have migration into the cities. And there was a strong reaction against that from um, essentially Marxist economists, starting with Arrighi's uh, study of the Rhodesian, labor in Rhodesia at that time in the 60s and the 70s, that said, no, the problem with the Lewis model is that what has happened in Southern Africa is not uh, a natural economic process. It's very much linked with coercion and dispossession and expropriation that created a system of circular migration. So Wolpe later took that up in the theory of cheap labor power. 
Now, going into the modern era of mass unemployment, how do we relate that theory to, like, what has happened since then? So, I'm saying dualism is, an, is a very important thing. How we actually present it to undergraduates and that, I'm not sure. The second is, which, and I spoke to Wendy about this before, the international, uh, the open economy macro is, is not uh, foregrounded in the book. And, uh, you know, Wendy says, well, there they, they teach it in the second year, and, and that's fine. But for us, as a small, open, dependent, commodity uh, exporting economy, open economy macro and our kind of role in the global economy and what it does to us is a first order problem as she put it. So there's something called the Australian model which uh, she's now saying that there is, there are texts around this that focuses on the real exchange rate um, that we need to look at if we can make an adaptation of that that is simple enough to teach an undergraduate. Of course, the, that links up to the whole issue of global commodity cycles and Dutch disease um, and the current account deficit and surplus. Okay. Uh, okay, Wendy and Sam hate this idea, but I'm going to just talk about it anyway. I thought... There are different things going on in different universities now and as far as advancing the core curriculum is. And it's important, I mean, it's an integrated text, which is a new way of teaching micro, macro, or in fact dispenses with those categories, but a new way of changing the whole curriculum. But it may take time to get there, and how do we begin to open economics to new ideas in the curriculum? One way, you could take the core text and do it as a third pillar of uh, a standard first year economics course that kind of says, okay, you're doing macro, you're doing micro, here's political economy. And political economy is about the capitalist revolution, technology, population and growth. Kind of takes those parts of the text that focus on um, the, the bigger questions. That are, that are generally not addressed in an economics course and makes that a core part of the first year uh, economics teaching. Um, might be a way, I mean, so it's, I'm not saying we should do this, but I mean, different universities would see whether it works, but it might be a kind of third way between staying where we are, which I think would be terrible, and, uh, and having this radical change, which would be great, but painful. Thank you.